Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit today about Internet of Things. I'll try to make it quick. And yes, it's a buzzword, 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 but we'll try to decompose it a bit and see what's inside. Uh, so first of all, before this lecture, I just found this, and it fits perfectly to this. Uh, so a bit about what Internet of Things is, though I bet all of you know, is this concept that everything will be on the Internet. You'll be able to check your refrigerator, your garage door, so on, so on. Uh, but that means more software, more components, more components have more software, more software has more bugs. Uh, usually software is more important than hardware, though sometimes the combination can be interesting, such as in the iPhone, but that's a different thing. Uh, most vendors don't have access to both software and hardware to combine them. Uh, so what we're going to have a look at is basically just talk about the few concepts that we saw and then we're going to get into a bit of embedded device hacking which is a bit of a big word for actually doing just unextract uh, okay so smart lock that's one of the things that we saw Ariel actually pinpointed that one out uh, which is a use I didn't even think existed before starting creating this uh, this presentation so apparently there's a little app that you can combine with a smart keypad that will let you unlock your iPhone using uh, the wireless, which is, I mean, just thinking about it, where you'd start researching it is completely crazy. There's a smart TV that everything comes now with smart TVs, all TVs that you'll buy in the last two years and furthermore. Uh, will be smart TVs. I bet some of you saw the news that there are microphones in the Samsung TVs and big exploits that are already known and never patched. Just a random question, did someone ever do a firmware upgrade on their smart TV? That's actually surprising. That's very surprising. Okay, so what we'll do today Instead of talking on these uh, regular smartphones, uh, regular smart items, uh, we'll take technology that is a bit more mature. We'll talk about routers. They're basically the same thing as all Internet of Things devices. They're little uh, hardware pieces with uh, some sort of Linux running on them. Uh, we chose router because of a few reasons. They're common. Everyone has a router. Uh, they're very mature. They've been worked on for ages. Uh, they're manufactured by very big companies and you can find them almost everywhere. Uh, but instead of just reviewing one, we're going to take an actual firmware and start playing with it a bit. Uh, so yeah, we chose this one. The reason we chose this one is not because it has something special in it. It's because when we created the presentation, we just downloaded two firmwares to see which one has a huge bug that you can find in five minutes of lecture time, because it's only 15 minutes, so to see what we can do. And we found this one. I uh, actually like it because I had this model about a year ago. So let's start opening it up and see what's going on. First of all, can you see? Is it any good? OK, so we have already have it here. Now. Basically, when you download a firmware, you just get an image. That image is a file that has multiple sections in it, multiple types. Uh, there is no one consistent method, uh, but you can just view it with Binwalk. Binwalk will give you, will do an analysis on the binary file and tell you which section has what in it, what type. Is it SquashFS, is it Zlib, or however it was compressed. Uh, basically, then you just start cutting it up and opening. Uh, we have something a bit easier, extract firmware with the firmware modification kit, and you just give it the firmware, uh, just download it from the site. It says 2014, that's true, but that's the latest firmware upgrade there is to that router. Uh, so as you can see, that's plain binwalk, it gives you the offsets, it gives you how it was compressed, it finds the main SquashFL file system, and now it basically maps it up and then copies it back. Uh, should be done in a few seconds and then you're just looking at regular uh, Linux file system. There's nothing special in it. Uh, we just walk in and start researching. Uh, usually 
you'll need maybe to do a bit of reversing to the binary files, but again, nothing really extreme. Uh, I had one film where I was researching and for 20 minutes I was stuck looking at a loop, at the login loop for the Telnet service. And, and I saw that it does a compare in the authentication for a username which is hard coded either admin, either user, but I couldn't figure out where it gets the password from until I scrolled a bit down and I noticed that it does the string compare again on the same strings. So there was an admin and a user hard coded into the binary. Now a lot of things you see as well, which the first time I saw it, I thought that the developer had to be drunk, but later on I saw that uh, most firmware has that. And when you take a look at the HTTPD binary, the, the web server that you have there, most, most of them have all the configurations and the HTMLs hard-coded in the binary. So when you actually open it up, you can see a nested if, that if the get parameter equals to index.html, give out this response, the entire HTML, and it goes on and on and on. Uh, so that was one interesting thing. Now the interesting, another interesting thing about firmas is once that you've analyzed them, they will be the same everywhere else, which is very nice. Uh, so as you can see, this is what FMK gives us. Uh, it's a bit hard to see on the blue, but there's a folder named image parts, which is just uh, images, the parts of the image that it's split up. There's the logs and there's the rootfs. The rootfs is the actual root, the actual directory. So it's a bit hard to see. Let's see if this makes it any better. Nope. So there's a bin, dev, etsy, firmware, lib, stuff like that. Uh, where would you start looking? Given a regular system, a regular Linux system, where would be the ju juicy stuff? Etsy will have the interesting stuff. So, again, nothing really much to it. Uh, you see a regular uh, Linux partition at the Etsy. You can cut the passwd.back, and you just get a normal passwd, not same as the shadow. Uh, now, I tried cracking it before I came here because one of the things I was worried about it is someone will point out, look, it's Unix hashed and salted and you'll never crack it. So, right back. Uh, okay, so apparently let's remove the John. What am I missing? It's an R. Right. So yeah, took a lot of time. So the password is 1234 to admin. Now that's in the Etsy. It's not really changeable. It's not the same as the UI, but if you open up an SSH server or a Telnet server, and most of them have that uh, already on by default, so you already got an admin username, which is the root and the password. If you want to continue on, there's also a VSTP passwd, uh, which is not very much different, as you can see. Um, and you can just continue on to see the uShare. And again, all these things you can see that are automatically enabled. Uh, you can see in which interface they're listening and in which port, which directories they give you. And of course, the passwords are the same. So it took us about five minutes to open up a firmware and find a username and password which are hard-coded. By the way, I'm sure, and I haven't tested these firmwares, but I'm sure if you'll take the binaries, you'll find another user. Most of the time, it's user with a capital U that's hard-coded into the binaries of the Telnet and the SSH that will also allow you to log into it. Now, I've had a lot of times people telling me, okay, so you can own a device from the LAN, but it doesn't really matter. Just look at the UPnP implementations. Most of the time, it looks like a fourth grader implemented them. You'll see the regular UPnP, and all you need to do, you'll see that it binds to all devices. It doesn't differentiate from where it gets the UPnP request. You can just send the UPnP XML request from the WAN, and it will map a local port out to the world. That's what you'll find on most routers. So with these two things, you already got a route on the device 
from the WAN. Nothing more to do. Uh, you can just Google it and see, just download firmwares, download the firmware modification tool. That's basically all you need to start hacking. Worst case scenario, use IDA to open some binaries. Again, they're never obfuscated, never checked in any way. Uh, so the point in that, uh, it's bad. It looks very bad. I'm sure some of you already had uh, some attempts at opening binaries and checking them out. It um, doesn't look good, but there's hope. Why there's hope? Because now things are getting a bit more intimate. When you have the content of your refrigerator and you have, uh, we also had, by the way, here a camera firmware, an IP camera, just standard, standard one. We also got a hard-coded username and password in the binary. So you can't even change that, even if you're the owner of the camera. Uh, so there's hope, because once people get a bit more intimate with their devices and see where they are and what they can do if a malicious attacker attacks them, I think it might lead to a bit of an upgrade in security, which is, at this point, non-existent. Um, and that's it. That was my time. <laughs>